Elon Musk, inventor and CEO of SpaceX and Tesla Motors, has characterized artificial intelligence as, quote, potentially more dangerous than nukes. Joining us now to put those fears to the test, in Palo Alto, California, via Skype, Steve Omohundro, founder of Self-Aware Systems, a think tank working to ensure that intelligent technologies are beneficial for humanity. In Washington, D.C., James Barrett, author of Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, via Skype, Manuela Veloso, the Herbert A. Simon Professor in Computer Science and Robotics at Carnegie Mellon University. And in Montreal, Quebec, Joshua Bengio, head of the Machine Learning Laboratory at the Université de Montréal and senior fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, CIFAR. And it's good to welcome all four of you to our program tonight. Uh, James, I'm going to put you to work off the top, and we're going to spend a bit of time on your book, setting up the discussion, and then we'll invite the other three guests to join us. The title of your book, Our Final Invention, sounds awfully ominous. Why did you write this book? <laughs> I wrote this book because artificial intelligence is the most promising technology of this century. The, the benefits are absolutely amazing in, in health, in diagnostics, in, in, in many uh, fields for, for the benefit of mankind. But we have to understand that artificial intelligence is a dual-use technology, not unlike nuclear fission. It has, it has a good side and a bad side. It can be used for, for good things and bad things, depending on who's using it. So I wrote my book to, to make it clear to the public that it's not all roses. It's not all, um, it's not all settled science about what's going to happen with AI. Well, give us some examples, if you would, of where AI is working in society today, and you're happy with it. Well, right now, it's, there's great, great headway in medical diagnostics. Um, uh, there's great stuff coming up in navigation and self-driving cars that will reduce the risk of driving on our roads. There are a lot of benefits, but there's also a lot of, a lot of harm coming to, uh, to, to uh, not, not good things coming from AI right now. For example, there's a big debate going on about autonomous battlefield robots and drones. And these are battlefield robots and drones that kill humans without a human in the loop. Those are being developed right now. We also have to remember that the NSA used really advanced data mining software to, to get into your phone book and mine and to mine the giant amounts of data they collect from, from our email and all, all the internet transmissions. So we can, already, we can already see the dual nature of artificial intelligence. Down the, in the short term, the questions of AI are about who controls the AI. In the long term, the question is, can AI be controlled at all? Hmm. We're going to play some tape that will help set up the discussion further, because the stuff you write about is very much out of a science fiction novel. Uh, this is, um, well, it's everything from very clever machines uh, to uh, a self-driving vacuum cleaner. I mean, that's artificial intelligence as well. So we're going to have you explain eventually how we get us from this. Clean your carpets and floors without lifting a finger. The iRobot Roomba vacuum cleaning robot gets rid of dirt. To this. Now, admittedly, that's pretty dramatic going from vacuum cleaners to uh, yes. the end of life as we know it. but. People are starting to get concerned about that. How come? Sure. Well, there's a couple of things that Hollywood and Hollywood AI uh, gets kind of wrong. For one thing, in movies, the humans always win in the end. In the long term, with artificial intelligence, we're not sure we're going to win in the end. The other thing is, because we have so much fun with movies, it tends to inoculate us from really looking at and scrutinizing the benefits and the, and the dangers of artificial intelligence. We know uh, we're, there are a lot of companies right now pushing very hard to create human-level intelligence. Uh, Google and, and uh, DeepMind, um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of personal assistants right now, like Siri and, uh, and one coming out from, from Microsoft, Cortana. So there's a big push to create human-level intelligence. Shortly after that's acquired, shortly after that's created, we may, be, we may be experiencing super intelligence or better than human intelligence. And right now, we don't really have a good maintenance plan or a really good way of judging whether or not we'll be able to share the planet uh, peacefully with, with something thousands or millions of times more intelligent than we are. 
We mentioned off the top of the program that Stephen Hawking was starting to sound the alarm about this. Let's play a clip from Stephen Hawking right now. Roll tape, please. I think the development of raw artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it will take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, could compete and would be superseded. And let's continue on giving you the comments of another person we already mentioned, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, who had this to say a few months ago. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. In all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, it's like, yeah, he's sure he can control the demon. Didn't work out. Let's go around and get some other wisdom on this. Joshua, what's your view on how concerned you think we ought to be about the perils of AI? I think we should not be concerned in the short term. And uh, in the long term, um, everything is possible, of course, but this is so far off what we currently see as scientists working on AI that uh, I'm afraid that um, this debate is, is, um, is not very useful. However, I do think that the debate about um, the bad uses of technology, including the AI technology, say for the military or other purposes, is something we, we ought to think about and have a social uh, discussion about. Steve Omohundro, what do you say? Well, I think there are going to be three phases. Right now, we're seeing uh, these technologies influencing the economy. Self-driving cars has the potential to really dramatically change things. Uh, McKinsey says that $50 trillion of value will be created by robotics and AI in the next 10 years. <clears throat> that's potentially going to cause a lot of dislocation, unemployment, and we need to deal with that. So that's sort of the, the short-term issue. Uh, James already mentioned the arms races and the military uses. I think that's sort of the second wave uh, where uh, an individual or a group could control uh, vast amounts of power. And then the longer term is as these systems become as intelligent as us, um, you know, our ability to control them will probably disappear. And so we need to think very carefully today. I don't think it's too soon to start thinking about what do we want these systems to look like? What do we want our future to look like so that we can build them uh, to create that future? Manuela Veloso, how concerned are you? Well, I agree with everything that is being said, but I have a more positive view of the problem or of the opportunity, which is, in fact, that this AI that people are talking about is created by humans. And the humans that we are, the researchers that we are, the companies that we are, we have the concerns that uh, about humanity. So these machines are a product of these researchers, are a product of the humanity. So I think that AI will go in the future where humanity will go. And uh, the concern is also to educate humans to care about each other and not really to only care about these machines themselves. Okay, Steve, in which case, how would you characterize the current state of research on artificial intelligence? Well, I think we understand the basics ever since von Neumann in the 1940s of how to create a system which tries to achieve a goal in a certain environment. Uh, there's been enormous advances with the, in compute power recently, which has allowed us to build uh, very, very powerful systems that are trained on vast amounts of data. And I think we see that in the advances in speech recognition and in these assistants like Siri. Um, I think the next generation, systems will start to modify themselves, understand themselves, and as uh, Stephen Hawking mentioned, that could lead to very rapid advancement. And so I think we need to have in place an understanding of the role of these systems and what we, how we want them to behave uh, by, by the time that occurs. Joshua, what are you working on right now in terms of AI? So I'm working on what's called deep learning. And it's one of the reasons why there is so much excitement about AI and probably one of the reasons why we're having this discussion. However, I can tell you that these systems don't have any ego, they don't have any autonomy. They're trained to do a very specific task and there's no way they can do anything else. They understand a very, very limited aspect of our world. And uh, th there's, it's impossible that these kinds of systems would suddenly reprogram themselves to do something else. When you say deep learning, what specifically does that mean? Well, it, this is inspired by uh, some of the things we know about the brain, but in a very loose way. And it's called deep because the computer learns to transform the data through multiple transformations, just as what happens in your brain. And at each level of these transformations, 
it builds more abstract notions of what it's seeing. Manuela, how about you? What are you working on? I actually work on autonomous robots, and uh, I work on robots that are capable of perceiving the world through sensors, such as a Kinect, a depth sensor uh, camera, and they are able to make decisions about where to go and eventually going. And in that type of like autonomy, I've worked on teams of robots that play soccer. I currently have robots that navigate at Carnegie Mellon uh, and service people escorting visitors to my office by themselves and transporting objects from one location to another. And they interact with people also through language. And if I say, go to Manuela's office, the robot may ask you, I don't know where it is. And the person needs to say, I mean, uh, 7002. And the robot actually learns from this interaction about how people refer to locations, which objects are in different locations. And my robots have moved around uh, with uh, the thesis of my student, Joy Deep Bisbas, for more than 1,000 kilometers in the building for the last three years and uh, they navigate autonomously. This is uh, maybe the uh, single place in the world where you actually come and see all these robots. Hmm. Manuela, do you think it's possible to invent an artificially intelligent soccer player that doesn't fake injury all the time? <laughs> it's a good question, probably <laughs> so. But you know, within robot soccer, for example, we have been pushing this goal by 2050 to have robots that can play with humans. But let me just add one thing about my work. I am actually, I've always been working on autonomy and being able to do things by themselves. But I currently, uh, I recently realized that these robots cannot do everything. And then I, I kind of introduced this symbiotic autonomy in which robots ask for help from humans, remote or present, or from the internet about things they can't do. And they build upon that to be able to fill up the gaps of what they can do. So I believe there is a coordination, a symbiosis that will always exist between AI systems and humans. Steve, what are you working on? Well, uh, I have done in the past uh, machine learning and uh, some of those things. More recently, I've been working on how to regulate these, kind, these systems. Uh, there's some new technologies, uh, cryptocurrencies and smart contracts use some cryptographic technologies that have the potential, perhaps, of bringing the legal system to autonomous agents. And so I think that's something which is very important and interesting, uh, doing a lot of work on that recently. James Barrett, you are hearing all of the different projects very exciting that our three other guests are working on tonight. And I wonder whether there's a part of you that is concerned that somewhere down the road, all of this may lead to, I don't know if beings is the right word to use, but let's say it, beings that are smarter than us. Yes, but you know, I hear these, I hear these wonderful advancements and I can't help but be excited. I think artificial intelligence is, is an incredibly profound look at ourselves and maybe the most profound look at ourselves of all the science. As we just heard, it involves neuroscience and navigation and robotics and physiology and perception and hearing and seeing. It's really, it's really rewarding. And we're learning more about ourselves as we, as we probe these, these areas. But you're right. I do have a suspicion in the back of my mind that autonomous robots can lead quite quickly to battlefield robots and autonomous drones. These are being developed right now, and I can't help but be anxious about that. I'm not sure if we want to be the species that introduces human-killing machines that, that do it autonomously. Manuela, um, though, sounds very uh, optimistic about the future and our ability to control whatever scenarios come down the road. How confident are you? Well, I, you know, uh, programming is, is, is big and it's often messy, and, and mistakes get made. Um, I think Steve Amahundro has been doing some really interesting work in trying to create verifiably safe systems. And I think in the future we're going to have to, as, as AI becomes more advanced and, and, and reaches human level intelligence and beyond, we're going to have to build systems that are provably, mathematically provably safe at every level so that we know exactly what they're going to do. Right now we're using a lot of black box systems like neural nets which are used in deep learning where you know what the inputs are and you can see the outputs, but you don't really know what's going on inside. They're black box systems. Evolutionary algorithms are another black box system. So I think all of these, all of these technologies sound very promising and, and the rewards will be terrific. But I think as we get further along, we're going to have to retrench and look at how to create really, really safe systems. Steve, every generation has its own example that it likes to poke at, I guess, or likes to uh, refer to when talking about AI, and I guess for people of my generation, 
Uh, we remember growing up with Star Trek in the middle 1960s and seeing the M5 computer that took over the Enterprise, and, 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 and that did not end well. Uh, what kind of verifiable safety mechanisms do you think are possible when you're dealing with artificial intelligence? Well, I think it depends on the domain you're, you're thinking about. Uh, probably self-driving cars is the one which is closest. Um, all the big companies around here, starting with Google, and now it looks like Uber is developing their own self-driving cars, and Apple is rumored to have a self-driving car, and Tesla's cars are going to drive themselves in two years. And so that technology seems very poised. Um, fortunately, that's a pretty constrained environment, cars on the road. Nonetheless, there are ethical questions. If a self-driving car kills somebody, who's liable? the software writer, the driver, the company that made it, and what kinds of rules do we need to regulate that kind of a system? The, the good thing about self-driving cars is we can think carefully and clearly in that very limited domain about what do we want? What kind of ethical rules are appropriate for that? As we move forward and these systems begin to be incorporated in every aspect of human life, I think the, the issues become much more complex. Uh, security is huge as we see you know, teenage hackers today are breaking into banks and stealing enormous amounts of money. Uh, if we had AI systems which were trying to do that, um, our current infrastructure would be very vulnerable, I believe. Yashua, uh, do you think people who do what you do are starting to think carefully about the kinds of questions that Steve just raised? Not really for most of them because, as I was trying to express, the kinds of uh, algorithms and machines we're building are really stupid, um, not even at the level of intelligence of a mouse. Now, things may change, and, um, and I think we should always be cautious because uh, you know, we can imagine bad scenarios, but in reality for now and for the foreseeable future, it's hard to see these machines suddenly uh, becoming um, self-aware magically without human intervention and, and taking over us. Now, of course, um, I don't have a crystal ball, and nobody does, so we should always you know, keep uh, our attention on the possibilities, but that's not at all something that's foreseeable with the current type of technology that big companies like Google and Apple and Microsoft are using. Manuela, let me follow up with you uh, once again. Well, let's use the example of the soccer players that you're working on. Uh, what if one of those players gets out of control, harms a, a real human uh, playing on the pitch? Uh, have people who do what you do begun to think about uh, ethically who's responsible, the programmer, the manufacturer, the whatever? Are, yes. are, are you thinking about those things? Yeah, I guess we are not exactly thinking about those things directly because, uh, as has been said, we are still in the infancy of having anything similar to uh, anything that's complete and can play and can think and can reason. I mean, these things are really uh, the beginning of start of, uh, we have very limited capabilities. Another issue is that, uh, don't forget that uh, currently the Roomba robot or the Cobot robot that moves around or the soccer playing robot does not do anything else. It cannot scramble the eggs, it cannot speak languages, it cannot understand anything. It's just this computer program of probably one million lines of code that does one single thing, which is where's the ball, kick the ball, where's the goal, kick at the goal. So we are, we don't understand much about the, yet, uh, or we don't, we are not yet in the understanding of these um, capabilities that, uh, that uh, people claim that AI systems can have, which may be the case. But let me just do one final comment here about this, is that in some sense, when I hear uh, Jim and Steve and I know about all these, sta these statements, it's true, all it's true. But I think that we are actors in this business and we are not spectators. We can change what's happening. And I feel that if we keep uh, educating people, making them responsible, and if we invest the efforts on people, on people, then the outcome of the AI systems will only be beneficial. Will only be beneficial because we have all this potential to help humans in many aspects that we will welcome this help. We invented this AI, it didn't come from the fall, from the sky. We are part of this process, we are not observers. We are actually, though it came out of human mind, it's our uh, research passion, it's our uh, scientific curiosity. No, I do appreciate that, but, but let me do the follow up with Steve here. I mean, we've, I guess we've heard stories about uh, chess playing artificially intelligent robots that when the game's over don't want to turn themselves off. I mean is that a thin edge of the wedge? 
Yeah, let me let me clarify. I totally agree uh, that current systems are not risks at the at the at the moment. The next generation, where systems have a deeper understanding of the world, can reason about the the deeper implications of their actions, that's where we start getting some unexpected things. One of the things I've studied a lot are unintended consequences of s seemingly good sounding goals. And so I, I like to use the example of a chess robot. You would think a chess robot whose one and only goal in life is to play good chess would be a harmless robot. But if it really understood the world and understood itself, if it were turned off, it would not be playing chess. And so it will develop an unintended sub-goal of keeping itself from being turned off. So even if you didn't build in any kind of self-protectiveness, the system will have a natural tendency to be self-protective because that furthers its goal of playing better chess. Similarly, it will try and get more resources. It'll try and make copies of itself, various things that can potentially be antisocial. And so we need to understand the uh, unintended aspects of even simple sounding goals so that we can build in the uh, human values and human ethics that we'd like these systems to exhibit. Well, that's just it. Yashua, is it fair to assume that AI will inevitably automatically evolve to be ethical and follow human values? Um, I would say, first of all, that we're making a big mistake of comparing AI to uh, humans and animals and assuming that they will change in a way similar and self-preserving as uh, humans and, and animals have evolved through evolution. Um, instead, those machines are built by humans. Now, I, I agree with everything that Steve said, um, although I think that, and, and I think we should be thinking about this ahead of time, although I don't think it's, it's a current concern, it, it is possible to imagine that uh, with uh, sort of the wrong set of goals, you could have behavior that's not socially acceptable. And we do have to think about these questions. And, and it, the answer is probably going to be having to do with how we set those goals. But for the short term, I would like to also say that there's a big difference between computers that understand and computers that do things, that, that act in the world. So we could, have, we could imagine having machines that are very smart from the point of view of understanding how things work, but they might be totally um, egoless, that they're, they don't do anything, they just answer our questions. When we start having computers that act in the world, that's where these, um, these ethical questions about social uh, impact and, and, and hurting humans um, uh, may come to mind. James, let me get you to react to a comment that I'm gonna to read to sure. you from Danny Hillis, the founder of Thinking Machines. He wrote this many years ago. He said, we are beginning to depend on computers to help us evolve new computers that let us produce things of much greater complexity. Yet we don't quite understand the process. It's getting ahead of us. We're at the point analogous to when single-celled organisms were turning into multi-celled organisms. We are amoebas, and we can't figure out what the hell this thing is that we're creating. Uh, what do you do when you really can't predict the unpredictable? Well, it's interesting because what, what's happening right now, from my point of view, in, in the field of AI is some really promising technologies, as I said, but what's happening is more rapid product development than uh, deep basic research into intelligence and the nature of intelligence. So we're creating smart devices and increasingly smart devices, and we're going to see, uh, we're going to see the cognization or the, the intelligence embedded in, in, in our world in a, in a huge way. And, and, and to reflect Danny, Danny Ellis's point, um, we're making something that we don't, we don't, we're making parts of it that we don't really understand. We don't have the big, the big overview picture. We're making a lot of products, we're, we're connecting a lot of things, and it seems almost sometimes as if we're, we're creating something uh, big and powerful that will ultimately replace us. And we, we don't, we're, we're not aware enough of every step to, to, to see the big picture. I think that's what the Hillis quotation is referring mm. to. And I think, you know, we, while we can't see it from here, Gary Marcus reviewed my book, Our Final Invention, for the, for the New Yorker, and he said, um, it, it, it really doesn't matter. In a in 100 years from now, it won't matter if it took 20 years or 50 years to reach human level intelligence and beyond. The important thing will be what, what will happen after. Will we have been prepared? And I think the Hillis quotation reflects that we're not really going to be prepared. 
We're, we're, building, we're building things uh, whose, whose repercussions we can't possibly understand. Hmm. Well, let me follow up with Manuela on that. We humans, somebody referred a moment ago to the fact that uh, humans have ego. And if we want to try to impress human values on what potentially comes next in terms of artificial intelligence, I presume we're going to, we're going to naturally want to put some human ego inside these artificially intelligent machines, no? Well, I, I'm not sure. I don't work as much on personalities and uh, that uh, research on ego. But probably, uh, probably yes. And they will be probably a product, these machines, of the environments where they live. Exactly like uh, when a new person moves to a new place, adapts to that place. And there will be these beings, these creatures that are different from humans, probably much more limited uh, and uh, but but still uh, will adapt to where to whoever interacts with them to whatever they are exposed to, uh, but uh, this is uh, I think that's how it will proceed. But it's important to also notice, and I insist on this point, that they are what humanity that what we will be, and uh, humans are in control of this process, and hopefully that will keep uh, the, the 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 goals of AI. Uh, in, in, in place. I just want to make one comment about Yosha uh, saying that the acting is probably what will make uh, more uh, problems, but the knowledge is what drives many things. So even if it, these robots or these AI systems only provide answer questions and provide input in terms of knowledge to people, the knowledge that these AI systems are going to select to make available to humans is also something that we, uh, we, we need to think about the same way that we need to think about what actions do the, uh, the autonomous robots take. Because somehow if the AI system selects to hide parts of the knowledge or to highlight parts of the knowledge and it's not completely neutral, it can influence as much as eventually an autonomous robot that moves in the world and is capable of making decisions whether to turn left or right or stop. So knowledge is as much uh, AI as, in fact, uh, actuation or perception or coordination between multiple robots. The whole paradigm of teams and groups and sharing of information is what AI is all about, and that's very beautiful. Yashua, can you even imagine human-level artificial intelligence in our lifetime? I would like to imagine it. Um, at the same time, I would like to come back to uh, this notion of super intelligence that you talked about at the beginning. Uh, some people think that uh, AI could become very, very quickly, very smart pa uh, past some point. But you could also equally argue mathematically and based on knowledge of uh, computations that uh, intelligence may uh, hit a wall of performance, that uh, as we build machines that are smarter and smarter, it becomes harder and harder for them to become smarter. And that may explain things like, you know, why are whales that have a much bigger brain than we do not that smart? Um, so we don't really know, and it's, it's completely out of our reach uh, in terms of uh, science to, to really answer these questions. We should keep aware of these possibilities, though. Steve, let me put a quote from Rodney Brooks to you. He's one of the fellows who invented the Roomba, that, that vacuum cleaner that, you know, skirts around like something out of the Jetsons in your apartment. And uh, here's what he had to say. Expecting more computation to just magically get to intentional intelligences who understand the world is unlikely. And there is a further category error that we may be making here. That is the intellectual shortcut that says computation and brains are the same thing. Could you react to that? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think it's very clear that the ability to take actions to achieve a certain goal in an environment, that that's a computational process. Um, the rational economic agent is sort of the underlying model for modern AI, and uh, von Neumann introduced that back in the 1940s. Um, further aspects of intelligence, like our creativity, our consciousness, our free will, our sense of qualia, or the you know the, the, the sensory quality of things, we really don't know what those are. And like Josh was saying, uh, there's a lot of questions there. Will intelligence hit a brick wall? 
we don't know. And so I think I think we can be very clear that that uh, predictable things like driving a self-driving car so that it chooses a good route on the freeway that we're sure it, we know how to do when it's going to get better. The further reaches, I think uh, it's going to be a great process of discovery that as systems are built, we're going to learn a lot. The Atlantic Magazine asked some futurists at the Aspen Ideas Festival this past year, when will the robots take over? And we're going to play some tape here of what some of them had to say, and then I'll get your comments. Roll tape, please. When will humans and robots become so similar that the distinction becomes unimportant? Robots are becoming more human-like. Humans, if, as we begin to control our own biology, our own DNA, as we begin to implant peripherals inside us, are becoming more designed objects. We will start to augment our biology through different types of nanotechnology and different types of uh, enhancements, uh, things to prolong our life, things to make us uh, fall ill less often, things to make us think faster, things to help us communicate through thought. Uh, so in a sense, we're already becoming cyborgs. There's just a few of us doing it. And I think uh, very soon, many more of us will be making these choices because uh, it will just clearly improve our experience as a human body, at least, if not a human mind. In our last few minutes, let's consider this last issue. Is the line between robot and human becoming blurred. James, why don't you go first? Well, I carry a phone in my pocket that's really a lot like an auxiliary brain. So I think that kind of migration has already begun. Um, and I think it's kind of a goal of a lot of, a lot of AI is to, is to learn how to replace damaged parts of the brain. Uh, neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists are working on that. Um, we're seeing a lot of advances in, in, in artificial limbs that connect to the brain. I think two uh, bionic hands were uh, implanted on two, on two different people in the last week. So I see that as kind of a natural and beneficial part of the advancement of these technologies. I don't think we're going to... But I also think that robots, autonomous robots, are being developed in parallel that won't be like us, whose, whose intelligence and, as Steve said, who's, the qualia... Uh, of their of their experience um, won't be like ours, and it will be quite alien. Okay, I want to uh, just to remind everybody we've just got a couple of minutes left, so let's get short answers so we get everybody in here. Manuela Veloso, what's your view? Is the line becoming blurred? I think that uh, it's very good to have humans be enhanced by the technology that is being developed, and I hope that robots will be able, to, uh, all the robotics research and AI will be able to move this further forward as the days of that the transistor was invented or that electricity was invented and that was the impact we are at uh, on one of the steps of our own inventions and the humanity is in control of eventually what will be developed and i hope that all these things will be taken into account joshua yes i agree with everything that has been said uh, humans are already getting smarter thanks to having, for example, a search engine at our fingertips. We're much, much smarter than our ancestors, just thanks to that access to so much knowledge. And the other thing I would like to say is that computers that are learning and becoming smarter um, can also take advantage of us to do things that they wouldn't be able to do by themselves. So we are working together. Um, they are becoming not just helping hands, but helping minds. And uh, we're helping them grow and, um, and be useful for us. Steve, is the line between robot and human becoming blurred? I think it is, and I, as others have said, I think there's a symbiosis forming, and that uh, if we can manage it so that we create a world that we like, I think we're gonna learn enormous amounts about ourselves and potentially create a, a wonderful future. Steve, what's your favorite AI movie? Well, 2001 was the one that I think influenced me the most. Gotcha. That's a good choice. Uh, it's great of all of you to join us on TVO tonight for a most fascinating discussion. Steve Omohundro in Palo Alto, California. James Barrett in Washington, D.C. Yashua Bengio in Montreal, Quebec. Manuela Veloso in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thanks so much to all of you. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.